Welcome to another Ally interview. I'm Stephen Bashong with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Today we're speaking with Dr. Yugo Oroku, a top rated New York City doctor and specialist at the city's gastrointestinal and liver disease practice, New York Gastroenterology Associates. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Yugo. It's my pleasure. I love your work. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Um, so one of the main things I wanted to talk about today is a lot of people in our community are worried about visiting hospitals, clinics, endoscopy suites uh, for screening, treatment, and even just general checkups. I want to know, in your opinion, should they feel safe in these environments? They should. I would say that's the number one question I get from each and every single patient. Hmm. Is it safe to come in? Uh, there was actually a study that was done in New York City where they looked to see how much disease was going about in the hospital setting. They looked at 25,000 uh, workers across 25 different health centers. They actually found a lower rate of COVID-19 in those hospitals than in the general population. It was 12% as opposed to 20% at the time in New York City. What does that mean? It means that we're doing the right thing. We're wearing the PPEs, the masks, we're putting on the gloves. We're sanitizing things. We're doing everything we need to do to make, things, make sure things are ready and safe for our patients to come in. Yeah, that should that makes me feel better. I'll tell you that much. Um, but what precautions should patients and people seeking screening take during their visits to these medical facilities to limit their exposure to COVID-19? You know, I think a big step is, is before you ever come in to figure out if you really do need to come in. Mm. One amazing thing our government was able to do was to pass a bill that put $500 million towards Medicare and towards private industries as well separately to make sure that you can access your, your medical doctor through telehealth. What does that mean? It's almost like FaceTiming with your doctor or Skyping with your doctor. We have secure channels. You're able to talk to us. And sometimes people don't need to come in. But when they do, a couple of things help. Number one, fill out all your registration forms before you ever get here. That always helps. Number two, ask the staff if there's anything else that you should know about. Where do you need to go within the office? Having a preset mind of what to expect helps people know that they can control the risks. Number three would be make sure you put on your mask. It's one of those things that works and helps. Uh, and um, when you get in, number four, uh, come on time. Uh, when people come on time, it keeps other people from waiting and it keeps the waiting room nice and empty the way we want it, six feet apart, socially distanced, safe for everybody. Makes a lot of sense. The last thing you want is a crowded room. That's um, correct. So how does, this is an important question, and there are many sides to this answer, and I don't want to get into the politics or anything here, just the facts. That's right. How does COVID-19 compare to other illnesses people can come into contact with at a hospital? The, the main question is, are we blowing this out of proportion? You know, I, I think um, we're not, um, we used to call it the novel coronavirus, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things about coronavirus, is that it's just novel. It's new to us, and so there's a lot we need to learn about it to control it. Over mm -hmm. time, like the current flu, we will get it to the point where it's manageable, but we're still working on that. We're working on vaccines, we're working on approaches. I think the biggest thing about coronavirus is that it, it can spread very pretty quickly. Uh, the flu, if, if 10 people got the flu, you would expect them to pass it on to 13 people. With coronavirus, 10 people pass it, it on to about 20 people. Mm -hmm. And so it spreads a bit more. In terms of fatality, you know, uh, not to get too sober, you know, the flu probably has about a 0.1% fatality rate with coronavirus, as best as we can tell, maybe 0.6, somewhere in that area. And so it's, it's not the worst disease that ever existed. It's just that we're trying to get it under control and it spreads. That's its one big superpower is that it spreads a lot. And then lastly, I would say it just presents in many different forms. And some, for some people, it's gastrointestinal, it's diarrhea, poor appetite. For other people, it's shortness of breath. For other mm. people, it's fevers. And some people have no symptoms at all. And so while we try to figure out the pattern of what that means, uh, that's really the big thing, to make sure our sick patients are protected from this virus. We're figuring it out, what it looks like, and we're getting it under control with our treatments. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, so you're in New York City. Um, everyone around the country heard a lot about New York City um, as COVID-19 cases were climbing toward their peak there. 
what was your experience like as a doctor, I mean, in the epicenter, the previous epicenter for COVID-19? You know, I, I think that first and foremost, I experienced it as a person, uh, just as a father of two, a husband, uh, as a, a kid of uh, my mom, a brother, uh, my, my siblings. Uh, it, it reminded me a lot about not, like of 9-11, uh, how the news of it um, just um, was really shocking and somewhat numbing. Uh, it was uh, something that initially started, it seems so foreign and so far away, but very quickly, you know, touched ground and we had ground zero here. It went from being something that was in Wuhan or Italy to something where our patients were getting it and eventually even some staff we knew who had it and then eventually we heard of people dying from it. I had a friend in his 30s who passed from it. Um, someone in my place of worship, my church, two people actually passed from it. So it became very personal and very real pretty quickly. And so um, ultimately, I think um, one of the things that happened is that we went from a position of just experiencing it to a position of wanting to control it. And I thought that was a very empowering step that New Yorkers took. Uh, we kind of wrested the locus of control out of the hands of the virus and we figured out what we, we could do. And I think that was a big part in turning it around and ultimately flattening the curve for us. Um, I'm sorry for the losses that you experienced due to COVID-19. Thanks, appreciate that. Um, to that point, what advice would you give to people, both patients and medical providers in parts of the country where diagnoses are rising? Yeah, so first and foremost, I have to say, of course, take it seriously. I feel in talking to my colleagues who are physicians in other cities and states where the numbers are rising, they get it. They feel it. It's less of a question. It's less of a question mark as to whether or not it's a scam. It's definitely a real virus. Um, in other places where the numbers aren't so high, um, they're not feeling it as personally. But I think taking it serious is issue number one. Hmm. Number two, again, what helped with us was realizing what we could do. Um, I knew that I could wash my hands. I knew that I could wear a mask. I knew that before I touched my mask, I could wash my hands or disinfect it with an alcohol sanitizer to, to avoid me like infecting myself. Uh, I knew that I could socially distance. And so passing that message on to our patients um, made a big deal, um, made a big impact, I think, here. And then secondly, as a provider, there's just, uh, sometimes there's just a role for bravery. You know, there's really no other way to put it. Um, you know, myself, I had to take uh, on-call services in our hospital here uh, through the period, but they were patients, they had colleagues who served in, in even greater degrees who even went to the COVID floors and were there full-time, so not just on-call, but full-time working day in, day out. And so it took a lot of bravery, I think, uh, and it really was impressive what not only the doctors, but definitely the nurses, the nursing techs, and really all the essential workers who day in, day out, didn't stay home, didn't call in sick, but got up and kept New York City functioning. The same people are keeping America functioning by just uh, getting out there and doing what they need to do, but doing it smartly by wearing a mask, socially distancing, make sure you're washing your hands a lot, control your social circle. This is not the time to hang out with everyone, limit it to a, a, a few number of people, and then just uh, keep it in touch with your doctor for your other medical needs. I think it's important as well. Yeah, I know we at the Alliance um, believe that medical providers um, are now and quite frankly, always have been heroes. Uh, so thank you for everything that you've done and your colleagues have done uh, during this time. Um, but beyond that, how can we patients, survivors and caregivers Thank you and others in the medical profession, you know, for being there through us, for us through this difficult time. You know, I think um, the biggest thing would be to, um, we hate to see uh, a divided America. I think if we could just get on the same page and talk things out in terms of our approach to the virus, we can't fight each other and fight the virus at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the word mass has become a little bit of a dirty word throughout the country. It doesn't have to be a surgical mask. It could be a cloth, bandana, whatever works for you. But just some sort of covering to prevent one person's germs passing to another person's germs. I feel like in our cancer community, we get it. We've worn masks as providers and as patients uh, for, for decades. 
But you know, the rest of America needs to catch up and realize this is not a partisan battle. We're all in this together. We need to get together and, uh, and we can get through this. Dr. Hugo, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. We really appreciate it. My absolute pleasure.